PhD in Progress episode 19. This week we talked to Mark Esposito, a Princeton PhD student and science blogger at breakingbio.org about establishing a career symposium at your institution. Let's go. So I just <laughs> refuse to be one. <laughs> There's a really good um, graduation speech for the guy says, he's like, and to all of you flaming hipsters out there, you're wrong and they are right. <laughs> the mindless crowds of those running on the treadmills. And That's an excellent graduation speech. Who is it by? Tim Minchkin. It's oh, best, Tim Minchkin. It's oh. the best one that I've ever seen before. They never, graduation speeches never keep in my mind. This is Otherwise, great. I remember that. Well, they all say the same trite. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always. Always. I, I love the Steve Jobs one. Okay. Find the intersection of your passion and the market. <laughs> <laughs> the the only two that have stuck with me are Kurt Vonnegut's and um, Tim Minchkin's. David Foster Wallace. I love both of them. God. I don't think, I've never seen that one before. Who's David Foster Wallace. Oh, I don't know. He's an author. He committed suicide. All the best ones do. Yeah. And his <laughs> book's like this big. Infinite Jest. It's infinite. <laughs> Good value. <laughs> yeah, it's unfinished. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. terrible value. No, no, there's another book though. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a literature expert. Me neither. Yeah, okay. All right. Welcome back to the PhD in Progress podcast, where we talk about your education, your career, and your life. I'm Jason. I'm Nick Hill. And today we're here with Mark Esposito. Es- ah, crap! I messed that up. <laughs> today we're here with Mark Esposito, a colleague in our graduate department. So, welcome, Mark. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, Again, I'm working in the Princeton Graduate Program. I'm working in the Cancer Research Lab there. Yeah, so another bio-nerd. Yeah, we know a lot of bio-nerds. Yeah, we're very bio-nerd heavy. We'll work on that eventually. But uh, And today we wanted to talk a little bit about the problem of um, alternative careers. Uh, so, uh, Mark, what does, that mean? what does that phrase mean to you? The For me, it means alternative because it's different from the default. The default career when you enter in graduate school is thought to be this. You come into grad school, you spend five, six years, seven, eight, Jason. La, la, la. <laughs> hey, well, I'm not eight yet. Jeez. And We're seven. <laughs> you know, after uh, putting in all that time, then you're expected to go and do a postdoc. At this point, a uh, secondary postdoc is almost the default as well. So after you've put... 12 or 13 years in investing in your post-college uh, education, then you need to go and start considering a faculty or tenure position at a major university, mm-hmm. and then converting, getting grants there, and then just proceeding with the le- rest of your life as a research scientist at a big academic program. Yeah. And it's basically the same, too, for humanities and anyone else who is trying to become a professor, right? They have to go through these postdocs, which... Um, if anyone's listening to this, they're pretty familiar with postdocs, probably. Uh, but low-funded, uh, temporary, well, temporary in air quotes positions where they work under a professor and are supposed to be gaining some training to make that next step into professorship, but it doesn't always become the case, right? That's the big problem right now. The cynics would say they're a pool of cheap labor that runs the research enterprise because yeah. they're independent enough to think on their own and run their own projects. Like, they don't need to be trained much further, but uh, they're not, you know, driving uh, innovation. They're not running their own labs. They're working for somebody else. Mm-hmm. And there's a great article from the Boston Globe that was put out a couple weeks ago, or last week, I think. Last week. Uh, featuring our friend Casey Edenberg, who's uh, a former, or is a graduate from our Princeton graduate program, and it's about postdocs in, I think, more specifically the biotech or bio industry, but... Yeah, biomedical research. Biomedical research. Yeah. But this is a problem that I think is pervasive oh, yeah, in definitely. all academic disciplines, humanities included. Definitely. Um, so, uh, but we were talking about alternative careers, and one of the issues there is that you know, what used to be the alternative of leaving science uh, or pursuing science outside of academia is now uh, kind of the default. Um, if you look at the success rates to get academic positions, it's somewhere around 10%. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that means that actually academia is the alternative career. 
so I t- kind of take issue with that terminology a little bit. Yeah, and we definitely should not focus on it being alternative, and we just wanted to bring it into the term of that that the tenure track route is the way we tend to think about it, especially when you start grad school. Most pe- people are, hey, I want to be, be a professor at some point. And throughout their grad student tenure, they realize maybe this isn't what's for me, or they go on to the postdoc and mm-hmm. decide there. So question for you guys, like, did you come into grad school thinking you wanted to be a professor, or what were your aspirations when you were a first year? I came in knowing that I was absolutely not going into academia later, whether it be teaching only or going into a major research institution. Yeah. I kind of thought I would be a professor at a school like my undergrad, which is uh, an, mostly an undergrad serving institution, so there isn't even a graduate student program. There's some basic research going on there. I thought it would be great to be a professor and do some teaching, do a little research. Uh, but once I saw what professors in our department go through at like a big name research institution and how hard it is for them to get funding. I I remembered back to what my professor as an undergrad at a smaller school, I I don't even know how she got funding Mm -hmm. because in an undergrad lab, you can't put out nearly as much data. I don't don't even remember if they put out a paper the whole time I was at that school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also came in thinking I wanted to do, uh, to be a professor, um, but the problem was when I was a senior in college, I didn't really do my homework and figure out what that meant. I didn't realize at the time that it was a lot more management, administration, and grant writing. I thought it was much more teaching heavy than it actually is. Yeah. Um, and so I had this misconception. And so today I think we're going to talk a little bit more about how to avoid those misconceptions about what certain careers are um, by learning more about them. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Uh, and if you really want the affirmation that you don't want to be a professor, your first experience writing a grant will okay. absolutely rub that out of you. Although if you haven't taken the chance to write a grant yet or a fellowship application, you should do that in absolutely. grad school. You should definitely do that the first year you can. If you're in science, basic science, you should be applying for your NSFs. If you're in health sciences, you should do NIH grants. Um, sorry, that's U.S. only. I know Canada has a, a bunch of awesome things, too, and the U.K. as well. Uh, anywhere else, really, you should be, too. Uh, actually, the Grad Hacker blog, which is something I write for occasionally, they had a whole grant writing week two weeks ago or so, so I'll post up articles there, and it gives you an outline for, you know... Isn't this you week the NSF NIH deadline? Oh, it might be. Yeah. I'm too yeah. old So to that. all you people <laughs> who have just submitted grants, good luck. Yeah, great luck. Let us know if you get anything. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah. All right, so moving on to not early grad student career, but finishing up and trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. Um, Why do you have to wait till you're finishing up to start thinking oh, you, about that problem? You don't. Well, we're, we're moving past that, that initial hurdle. That, that's a great point. You should be studying. You should be learning all you can, not only about your research, but about the career path you'll be going on. Because once you have a, a goal in mind, or at least narrow down the the things that you can. Well, if there's one thing that graduate school is good at, it's making you stop and think, why the hell am I even doing this? Oh, yeah, yeah. every day. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, maybe maybe often for you, but... God, every morning... Everybody, <laughs> yeah, everybody has that experience at some point. Every morning, I'm like, I need to write my thesis, and what should I be doing? I have no idea. All right, so, so that's let's a talk good question. About this. Yeah. yeah. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, Mark Esposito here was really instrumental in setting up a career symposium at our school to help address the questions of what else is out there and what else can we look forward to. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yep. So the plan for the event was that we would have one day, kind of this whole symposium where we brought the, a broad array of careers into um, focus for all the graduate students in the department. And partially the motivation behind it was selfish. I wanted to know by myself. Actually, most of it was selfish. <laughs> but All for you. <laughs> yeah, all for me and the committee. But on the other side of things, it was a lot about trying to bring in um, former alumni, setting up a network for those alumni so that students in the future could have more of this conversation and the program could become more of an inclusive program where we have 90% of our alumni in other careers and those alumni want to come back and give back to the institution that trained them, that gave them the excellent training that allowed them to succeed. So I wanted to have a two-way conversation set up and to 
start that conversation, I wanted to set up this career symposium and bring in all those people. Mm -hmm. So um, what it involved was kind of orchestrating between the alumni, uh, the students, and then the administrative faculty to try to get this whole event going, um, bringing in money, bringing in speakers, and then finally making sure that students were interested and receptive to that kind of event. Uh, and this is the um, the second time our department's done something like this, This right? is actually the third. The third, okay. Yeah. So, and actually the previous two, the first one was set up by Kevin Forrest in 2003, and um, the next one was set up by Adam Everett in 2011. And we actually tried to invite both of them to come back, but we only got Adam to come. Because he's great. He's one yeah. of our classmates. Yeah. Yeah. And he's got yeah. a very successful career in uh, life sciences consulting. And Super interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, since then, we've had a couple people working with Adam who, you know, got his... All of his details from the career symposium were interested in his career, and they're oh, following great. up with him right now. Yeah, so, so that cultivating sounds, those kind of connections is yeah, really launch. important. Yeah, and that was the most phenomenal thing has actually been the follow-up to the career symposium, where all the speakers came back and asked that we make them work for us, that we make them bring resources back to the students, and we've actually had a couple others that have sent a few jobs in. And oh, also that are interested in mentoring. We have a few people that are interested in just coming back and meeting students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. That's really cool. Um, one of the things I noticed is that immediately after the symposium, uh, you set up a group on LinkedIn for the alumni of the mm -hmm. program and for the current students. So um, what prompted that, and what do you think about LinkedIn, and how should you use LinkedIn to, to sort of uh, maximize its utility? So that was actually a suggestion from someone who's setting up the PhD MD program at Rutgers. His name is Jim Milanig, and he's trying to set up this program at Rutgers where current graduate students are trained and given the resources to go into either business or go into management or go into all the other different areas of science that is crucial for science to function, crucial for the biotech industry to go forward. So his suggestion was that we maybe start to partner with Rutgers and maybe start to institute this more of the more of this system, but we wanted to set up an inclusive Princeton network first. And LinkedIn is definitely the easiest way if you don't know somebody already but want to try to get into their field, LinkedIn makes that very accessible. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. We've already had a good conversation with um, Amy Pizlkowski. Who oh, yeah, is, she loves LinkedIn. Yeah, she yeah. is a great LinkedIn proponent and our career services officer for at least the sciences here, and she's been very helpful. Um, and I find it personally really great because I get to look out across all these people. I, I don't know everyone on LinkedIn, obviously, mm -hmm. but I can still look at companies, find some people that I might have someone in common with and talk to them. That's all where it starts, right? Yeah, and it's tough to use any kind of in-house program like the Career Services Tiger Tracks because that's only limited to the people who proactively go and sign up for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, like, there are pros and cons, right? Yeah. Like. We, we have here at Princeton a, a new system, an in-house alumni network that you can go ahead and fi find an alumnus who might work at a certain company or have a certain type of job or w live in a certain area and you can talk to them. But that is really dependent on people caring enough mm -hmm. once they leave here, right? Yeah. And that's something that the other thing is that in-house service really caters to the undergraduates. The graduates have up until this point, not had too much of a network that they can mm -hmm. rely on once they leave. Actually, if you go on to the website, they're trying to institute some type of alumni giving or alumni relations to get them back. And that was a big push um, before the symposium started, was that graduate school actually wants to start up these um, two or three day symposiums or networking events where they're inviting the alumni, the graduate alumni back, and are trying to get them as engaged as the undergraduate alumni have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was, um, I don't know if, uh, so Jason and I had a conversation with the dean of the graduate school, um, I, I think last semester, and this was one of the things that he talked about. So I'm really glad that he's closing the loop and actually, like, mm -hmm. you know, making that happen. Yeah, um, and so this career symposium yeah. almost happened under that umbrella. We were just a little bit too early, and I think that in the next two or three years that will start to happen more often. Be great. Cool. Um, so, in terms of like actually organizing the symposium and, and getting volunteers involved, um, or you know, what? Um, how did you do it? Yeah. So the the first thing was making sure that there's money there. No money, no event. You know, that's always yeah, the right. case. 
So the first thing I went to was I went and spoke to um, our administrative staff and then also the head of the department and found that this our, our department's incredibly supportive of the career symposiums, and they had actually written this into the training grant that we received, okay. that this would happen once every two or three years so that students could have exposure. So this is NIH money that we're spending on this? This was written into the training grant, but that doesn't necessarily that mean that it's being funded by the NIH. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I think that there's more or less a slush fund. Uh-huh. Yeah. That this kind right. of thing comes out of. That's cool. Yeah. But the the department's very supportive about it. And you mentioned that there's another school that had private donations to get it off the ground. Oh, did I? Um, no, I mentioned this. Okay. So oh, okay. there was, um, I went to a, a similar uh, career symposium called Beyond Academia. So um, shout out to those guys. Um, they're at UC Berkeley. Uh, and their department was not as supportive, or it was a bunch of students from a, a number of departments, mostly in the life sciences, so, you know, molecular biology, vision sciences, um, so biomedical research, and uh, their departments didn't want to take the responsibility and mm -hmm. fund this event out of yeah. pocket. Um, so uh, the students were very proactive. They were like, you know, this is a really important thing. We need to get this information out there. Uh, and so they went around and raised money from corporate sponsors. Yeah. So even if your department isn't supportive, there are sources of money out there. And, you know, companies are really happy to talk to smart people. And, you know, this is useful for them as a recruiting tool. So it's a two-way street. You can usually convince them that it's worth their, their investment. Yeah, the companies are actually thrilled to do this. They're actually all wondering why they can't come more often to Princeton or other schools like that and speak. Um, we've actually had three companies so far that have asked to be able to do a career day and have done it through that LinkedIn group because um, maybe because the administration's too busy or there's also the issue of if graduate students are being funded by tax dollars, they don't, the people who are doing that funding don't necessarily want them going into private enterprises using that training of tax dollars. Yeah, it's kind of hard to promote that on the yeah. training grant applications. Or yeah, whatever. Right. which is yeah. why our department's actually very exceptional in that matter. Um, and it may be because Shirley's at the head and, you know, she had that phenomenal report about how alternative, alternative careers have become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so step one, raise money. Raise money. Absolutely. Uh, and would you mind uh, giving a ballpark of, like, how much this, this cost? Is that, yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm not <laughs> sure how specific I can go on that. The, the first one that happened cost around $13,000. Mm -hmm. um, for it to happen. Then this one, we actually cut by keeping everything local. We kept it a little bit under $10,000 for the okay. event to go ahead. Um, and the first couple times it was that projected budgets went around. They're actually anticipating somewhere around 25000 or 30000 something on par to the way that the recruiting budget works. So what were the most important costs? I'm sure there, because we, we have like a reception there too. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know how important that was to the core function, but Maybe things like funding people's travel in yeah. case they had to do travel, that. Travel and lodging was the most expensive by yeah. far. Um, and again, since they were interested in coming back and recruiting most of the alumni, uh, honorariums weren't part of the consideration at all. Okay. Um, and so it was definitely keeping people local. Uh, that meant that they had to stay fewer days for their career symposium, also that they only had to pay for train tickets or driving. And right. so in most cases for people coming from New York City, that was only... $33 here and back for travel. Cool. Uh, so, okay, so you have money. Um, how do you go about um, finding speakers or people to come and talk about? Or, you know, how do you connect or reach out to all these alumni? Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was the toughest part, was finding contact details for all the alumni we wanted to speak to. And so first we asked faculty for suggestions. They're the ones who have been sending out these alumni to different places they should usually be keeping up with those alumni. So we got about 20, 25 suggestions from the current faculty in the department, um, but none of those faculty had current contact addresses. So, again, went to LinkedIn, or we were just Googling places and calling the company trying to get that contact info. Um, and then last resort, we finally went to the um, kind of head administrative staff of the department, Elena, and asked her, and she had a database of every single alumni since 1989, yeah. Current positions, previous positions. The statistics, they everything. don't tell the first years. <laughs> Correct. That was that was an invaluable document. I've never come across something before that I was so excited to get. So if you were at a place that wasn't as supportive of this idea, how do you think you might have approached this problem? Uh, that would have been 
incredibly difficult, I think. I think it would have been a lot of legwork just getting on to different companies, searching for people's previous education, and then trying to find, um, through word of mouth or other sources, alumni that may be interested in coming back. Well, it wasn't just you who did the organization at the end of the day, right? So how did you go around? How did you go about um, getting other graduate students to volunteer and help out? Yeah, so more important than the money is getting four or five other people that you know put in who are invested in it, who want to go into alternative careers. So I knew people that were interested in teaching, liberal arts, people interested in communication, and then people interested in going into biotech. And so those were ones that I actually heard over the previous year. Express an interest in those jobs, and those were the people that I approached. Cool. So you assembled a good team, like an Avengers of finding out these career and tracking down these people. Yep, Avengers of Science. Avengers of Science. <laughs> That's what the next committee should call themselves. So we did this based on alumni. Correct. Could you imagine doing it with people who weren't alum? I think that being in such a heavy biotech um, area with just near New York City, and then that there's actually five or six hundred companies right in the Princeton area. I think that they would have been more than happy yeah. uh, to come and speak. And we actually heard that there used to be a program where Princeton graduate students would go to Bristol Myers Squibb, which is only four miles down the road, and would actually go and spend a day or so there researching. And this actually used to be a very tight collaboration. Mm-hmm. And so I think that local companies would be, again, more than happy to be recruiting PhDs. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I thought that was also uh, the case for the conference at Berkeley. Um, a lot of the local companies, um, it wasn't necessarily that they had the alumni connection, although a lot of them did, but they were interested in connecting with graduate students mm-hmm. and getting them involved in yeah. uh, the research there. And there are a lot more startups in the Bay Area than here, um, so that was interesting too. I feel like uh, a more uh, one of the uh, strongly represented alt career paths at Berkeley was quitting graduate school to join a startup. Yeah. Uh, so. Or a consulting firm that's huge. I've known a few people yeah. from Berkeley and Stanford. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a different culture there. Yeah. Um, that's very common for undergrads too, to like drop out of college and do that. So. Well, this is actually something that I think almost no Princeton students come across. There's a huge biotech corridor right along the Forestall campus. It's called College Road. And there's, there's probably 500 biotech companies right over there that we never even are exposed to, that really? we never even hear of. That's interesting. Cause so that, how would you connect yeah. with them? So so in this case, there was actually, um, at one point, a flyer that was posted in the central lobby of LTL looking for a position, a consultant position at one of those firms. And so they do, I guess they do get the word out every once in a while, but hmm. it's uh, other than that, I haven't seen any other methods of contacting them. Yeah, I feel like the, the smaller companies are really... Well, first of all, they have the problem of they don't, well, we have the problem of they don't need that many people, right? They're new, but they still want to find the best talent. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the small companies have a bad time getting out the word Yeah. when it shouldn't be the case, especially now when everyone's on LinkedIn, you can Mm -hmm. be looking for, you know, maybe they have a more targeted approach or something like that. But as someone who is trying to find a job at one of those places. You have to be proactive and kind of seek it out yourself. And maybe something like a career symposium like this would be helpful in that. Yep, absolutely. And on the less altruistic side of things, most of these guys get a bonus when they bring on somebody to their company. Ah, I so, see. So, you know, that can range anywhere from 5000 to even up to ten dollars or $20,000 for some of these guys. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. So remember, it's not just a one-way street when you're asking for a job in the future of networking. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know about that. Mm-hmm. Especially in the bigger consulting firms and the venture capital in New York City and Boston area. Mm-hmm. I think it's always a good idea to think from the mindset of what do I have to offer? You know, it's it's not just, you know, these people are helping you out by telling you about their careers. It, it is a two-way street, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. I think that that's, that's an important thing to, to note. Um, right. So we were talking about the career symposium and the logistics. Um, so uh, one of the other logistical challenges is uh, scheduling. So how did you manage that? Yeah, so we came into a lot of issues here. We were, I guess, fortunately constrained by the fact that we had to fit in the first week or so of school. That's when everybody's been starved for seminars over the summer. They haven't gotten free food in a very long time. <laughs> so that makes it an attractive event to start out with. Um, and that's also uh, that also happened to end right at the... Um, 
third business quarter, um, right around that time. So when you're looking at planning this kind of things, you need to be looking at first, if I want to invite professors or teachers, the first week of school, they can't take off any time. Um, so you either need to get somebody who's on sabbatical or somebody who can get someone to cover for them. And that was difficult. Um, but really, we wanted to make sure that we had the maximum turnout for students, that the students were engaged, and we thought that the best time for that would be the first week of the school year. Then we get the fresh graduate students coming in as well and get to grab their, you know, yeah, elastic sure. minds before they really get into the alternative <laughs> career mindset. Mm-hmm. And then how did you come up with the format for, like, the panel discussion or the... Um you know, you, you mentioned that there are these different sort of categories of jobs out there. So mm-hmm. can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, so personally, the way that I wanted to approach it was I tend to get bored after 15 minutes of speaking. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to have... How far are we into this? <laughs> no, sorry about that. Yeah, so... Uh, good point. I'll make it quick. Um, yeah, so I wanted to have this kind of barrage of different careers of options that people would have um, coming in a very short amount of time and have a couple different sessions of that. So first a quick, you know, a quick snap of what these people were doing and then multiple points over the day for people to interact. And the best, best format that really fits that is to set up these different categories so that people can choose to either come to a session of business or come to a session of science communication. Within each hour-long session or so, we have four or five speakers with a QA and a at the end. And then that also gives the students the ability to pick, okay, I want to go and have lunch with a business speaker. And then at the reception, okay, now I want to speak to somebody in communication. So there's multiple tiers of interaction. You know, one is just this one-way speech, and then after that, you can have back and forth with the speakers that you found interesting and follow up with the ones that you have questions for. Yeah, I found that really useful, and maybe if I were a first or a second year, I would have stuck around for everything, but mm-hmm. I knew... You didn't stick I, around for everything? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I did a little science. <laughs> I did a little science. Um, but I knew I didn't want to go into the education route, and you had, a, I think, a high school teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, you had a professor... You know, you had people in the education field, and I knew I didn't want to do that, so I was able to skip that hour or so. Um, but I still came back for the science and policy deal, and it was great that I didn't feel constrained there the whole mm-hmm. time. But yeah, and also was, great that other people could have been there the whole time. Yeah, that was something that we really wanted to get at. We didn't want to force somebody to spend the whole day there. We wanted people to come and focus on the career that they were interested in and not take up their whole day. We really wanted to have a valuable interaction. And the the question and answer panel itself where they put together the three or four speakers who gave the talk during that session and people just asked whatever questions and there was time in between each section so that you know if you wanted some coffee and to maybe talk with your friends about something or try to talk to the speaker if they had some free time Mm -hmm. i thought that was really helpful yeah well i'm glad you feel that way yeah it was during during the course of the event we felt that everything went better than expected and that students were really getting a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think that people want it even more by the end of the day. Um, Was there anything that you would have done differently, or was there anything that you felt you could have improved um, for the next iteration? Mm -hmm. Um, It went, you know, as I said, it went really well. Everybody was really happy with it. What we did want to do was, um, and we did, another important element was we did a post-event survey, both from the the student side of it and from the speaker side. And the pieces that people felt were missing were that we didn't have enough liberal arts educators come. Um, That was a huge category that people wanted to get into. Um, And there was actually much less interest in the people that were doing scientific management. So the ones that were coordinating science, setting up grants, making sure that money went to the right places, that was actually where we found the least interest. So I think in the future, we'd like to reprioritize, um, especially have maybe a few more business sessions, have a few more people who are working with liberal arts, and then maybe um, some more communicators, and then less people who are working on um, the management side of science. Yeah. But in terms of scheduling, um, money, the sessions and everything, uh, for a one-day event, I think that everything was just about right. And there's also right now a website being, uh, a page being dedicated to 
the programs and all of the planning materials, so that'll be accessible online. I'm oh, sure that's you great. guys can yeah, link we'll to it. Yeah, we'll share it through here. And yeah, uh, it, especially like a PDF of the program or yep. something. I think yeah, would be all, helpful for all me. that stuff will be up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think ultimately the goal is, you know, um, for other people out there or listeners to uh, be inspired by what you've done, Mark, and and try to replicate it at their own institution mm-hmm. and spread the word about these so-called alternative careers. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's really important to get the conversation rolling right mm-hmm. now. And that's how I want to view the event is starting a conversation and not it being a one day thing, but it being the start of this back and forth between alumni companies and then the current students. Right. And, and more broadly, you know, this, this is a problem that a lot of PhD students like to talk about and they like to complain about it. But at the end of the day, you know, it's your responsibility to do something about it. And I think, you know, Mark, your approach with putting together the symposium and trying to like reach out to alumni is a really great place or a great way to 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 sort of attack the problem. Mm-hmm. I also think on the other side, though, that a lot of students may take issue with being proactive about this because we are given, you know, the worker mentality, the the science for science sake. And if you're the best scientist you can be, then things will fall into place. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely a mentality that you can find within the department. But one of the speakers even said, remember, you're not worker bees. You know, you're trainees. And yeah. that was a point she really emphasized. What was the faculty reaction to this symposium? I mean, you mentioned that some not everybody in the department sort of buys into this Correct. All career. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, so there was a whole range. There were some, especially the younger faculty. Actually, the younger faculty were the ones that had the most divisive opinions. There were really? some. Yeah. So there were some who do not believe in the idea of alternative careers at all, especially using the term alternative careers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are other faculty who say that if you're the best scientist possible, then everything will fall into place for you afterward. Um, but on the other side of things, there are also a lot of faculty who are starting to work in close collaboration with a lot of biotech companies, whether it's testing drugs or testing new protocols. And they're very interested in this type of collaboration, especially getting their alumni into these companies where there's a stronger connection forged there. So there, there wasn't any one single reaction that went all the way from the more, most supportive to least supportive. Mm-hmm. And what about the like older faculty? Because um, they've, you know... They uh, became professors in a very different market, mm-hmm. in a very different environment. And for them, I think academia was uh, sort of the default career in numbers as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I can't say that mm-hmm. I know exactly what they thought about the program. What I can say is that they were thrilled to see their former students come back. Yeah. Um, they were just, and um, for all of the speakers that came, we actually invited their respective PIs to come to the dinner. And the PIs at that point were thrilled about having them back and, you know, just sitting down and asking them, what what have you been doing for the last 20 years? And do you still remember how to streak out a plate? <laughs> we actually, we, we had a former professor from this department who ended up going into industry and doing a few roles there and is now in charge of, uh, was it Huntington's Disease yep. Foundation? I thought that was super interesting because he had the perspectives of everything. Uh, Alongside that, we also have professors in our department, and I think this is probably true for a lot of the big life sciences uh, departments in the country, where professors have been on boards of companies or started Mm -hmm. companies, and so they have that perspective as well. And they tend to be the ones who started doing molecular biology when molecular biology was becoming molecular biology, right? And I think we benefit from that because we do have such a big diverse um, I guess group of opinions on what alternative careers are and we get to hear that kind of conversation maybe not between the professors themselves but by attitudes that we pick up yeah I think that we have some great role models in the department because we do have one person who's on the board of Merck um, and they you know from that lab those people are able to go and transition into that company and then there's also other companies, like Merck is also collaborating with a bacterial lab here, and they um, will send their library back and forth and set up assays with that lab. So there's good back and forth there. And then there's also um, Professor Enquist actually came from Genentech and was one of the first people to work at Genentech and then made the transition to academia. So he's another great person. I just started reading uh, a book about the beginnings of Genentech. I'm hoping I catch his name somewhere in there. That'd be really <laughs> sweet. Yeah. 
Yeah, him and Bob Stein. Yeah. yeah. So I do think that almost any large department is going to have a diverse spread of faculty, you know, especially the older ones who may have come from those first big biotech companies and then made their transition back into academia. I don't know if in the future that will become more or less common. I'd anticipate less common. So there's two um, sort of things in addition before we wrap up. Um, one is, you know, this group at Berkeley, uh, there's, um, they have a uh, postdoc and graduate student group that does consulting projects for the local biotech industry. Do you think that's something that we could replicate in our own department? I, I also know of a program at Stanford that's working in the same thing, and I think that that is absolutely an option um, that would motivate a lot of the students a lot, and that's because they can go in and they can't get paid by these consultant companies, but they can go in and learn these real-world skills of putting together a case or working over some of these you know, short end goal um, projects and gaining that experience, and then also gaining networks and inroads with that company. Um, and I, I related, you know... Um do you think it's possible for graduate students to take a summer and do an internship at a a biotech company? Or is that something that most PIs would just say, no, no way. I, that's, that's a tough thing for me to say without incriminating myself. Yeah. (laughs) I I think that that's very PI dependent. I know that there have been people in the department that have gone and taken a summer or taken even a year. Um, The department allows, I think nine months of a sabbatical at any point during your PhD or a leave of absence. Mm -hmm where you can go and do that, but it's absolutely not on the table for the vast majority of graduate students here. And I think that's something that should be started, whether it be a graduate student consultant club where they can do due diligence services on the side, or whether we set up some type of professional collaboration with the local companies. Because there, those local companies want, you know, want some, want a fresh viewpoint and want to be able to dip into that talent pool. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Mark. This has been a really uh, enlightening conversation, um, for me at least. I hope it's also uh, me too. useful sure. for Jason and for our listeners. Most importantly, the listeners. Yeah. I would actually ask the listeners, uh, so we came from a very biotech-heavy alternative career, supposing. We had people going straight into industry, doing science there. We had like patent lawyer, lawyers, right? Uh, we had educators, we had a bunch of all these different policy group people. I would ask the listener, if you've done a similar type of career symposium, but maybe from like a historian or humanities or social science perspective, I'd love to hear about it, and we'd love to do a little feature on our site, too, to go alongside what we did here with our Life Sciences Career Symposium. Mm-hmm. And remember, if if your department's not supportive, there are always things that you can do for yourself, too. You know, there's, we there's will always. Tell. <laughs> yeah, well, so great. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah. A very special thanks to Mark Esposito. You can find some great, accessible science posts by Mark at breakingbio.org. We hope you can take some of his advice and start discussions of alternative careers at your school. He was nice enough to write up a summary and supporting materials that you can find at phdinprogress.com slash 19. If you enjoy the show, please help support us. The best way to do this is to leave an honest review and rating in the iTunes store. Any comments you have will go a long way to spread the word and popularity of the show. Also, get in touch with us on Twitter. We're at PhD Podcast. If you're a big fan and want to help increase the quality of recording and distribution, definitely consider becoming a patron by supporting us at patreon.com slash phdpodcast. Even $2 a month gets us closer to adequate hosting space and equipment. Thanks to Ben McNeil and Sally Ponchak who are currently supporting us. As always, you can find all the information we talked about and more at phdinprogress.com. But one of the speakers even said, remember, you're not worker bees. You know, you're trainees, and that was a point she really emphasized. 